Is there a sound? Please tell me there's a sound. She said there should be. She there should be? I she might as well talk to it, that. too. Right about up in the corner. You From beginning. All the way over. See all the way over. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my, my name is Leah Brownridge, and my presentation today is on John Piaget and the theory of cognitive development. And there he is, isn't he cute? He's a little grandpa. The cognitive, cognitive development theory. There are two, process, two processes are essential for development. Assimilation learning to understand events or objects based on existing structure. Accommodation, expanding understanding based on new information. There we go. John Piaget, born in 1896 and died in 1980. The behavior of children and the development of their thinking can only be explained by the interaction of nature, intrins intrinsic development, and nurture, extrinsic environmental factors. Goal of cognitive development is biological survival. Cognitive development as biological adaptation, adaptation of mental constructs from experiences, learner as the little scientist. Knowledge originates from the environment. Assimilation and accommodation lead to equilibrium. Cognitive development involves active selection, interpretation, and construction of knowledge. The major, where did that go? Okay, this is so weird. The major players in creating the theory of cognitive development. John Piaget, Lev Vygotsky, and Jerome Bruner have all added a piece to the puzzle of cognitive development theories. It is important to note that in most instances, Piaget and Vygotsky contrasted each other. And Grace's pre presentation, which will be after <laughs> mine, is on Vygotsky. Why does it keep doing double things? Very strange. Background of John Piaget. John Piaget was born in born on August 9th, 1896, in Neuchâtel, Switzerland, and died on September 17th, 1980. Graduated with his PhD in science at 22 years old from, from the University of Neuchâtel. Originally studied biology and philosophy, so he didn't in initially start working with children. He did that later on. In 1921, Piaget started to study child psychology. Piaget had three children, two daughters, and a son of his own. Published several studies in the field of child development and child psychology. Who influenced Piaget? Piaget was influenced by Claude Lévi-Strauss, a French, French anthropologist, a revolutionary in the field. Studying under C.G. Jung, who was a Swiss psychiatrist and founder of analytical psychology, Piaget furthered his knowledge. The Swiss psychiatrist Eugene Bleuler, was introduced, who introduced the term schizophrenia and was known for his work with schizophrenia patients, also guided Piaget's knowledge. Here we have the major concepts of the theory of cognitive development. So we're looking at stages. Piaget's co cognitive development stages. Sensory motor, birth to two years old. Pre-operational, two to seven years old. Concrete operational, which is seven to 11 years old. And formal operation, which is adolescent <coughs> to adulthood. In the sensory motor stage from birth to two years old, infants develop their intellect. In the pre-operational stage, two to seven years, old, seven years old, children begin to develop symbolically and imaginatively. The concrete operational, seven to 12, children learn to think logically. And that's what all of the <coughs> items over here are, because we're gonna play a game at the end and we're going to kind of go through and kind of guess after we hear all of the information, we'll be able to apply it. And formal operationals, 12 to adulthood, adults develop critical thinking skills. Ways the theory of cognitive development have influenced how we work with children. The, the theory of cognitive development is one piece in the puzzle that makes up early childhood and how we understand, teach, and care for young children. Each piece plays an instrumental part in creating our own philosophies of early childhood. 
Knowledge creates power. We are much more powerful in the field of early childhood when we refer to and utilize research-based practices. This specific theory teaches us to look at childhood through specific stages, which helps us to understand what is developmentally appropriate and what goals are feasible for children in different age brackets. So I like to explain to my staff in my classrooms when we talk about children, and I use, I kind of turn this into the stages, but I also use like a stair phase. So each level is a stage, a stair phase. And you can't skip a stair, because what would happen if we skipped a stair? What would we do? We're gonna fall. We would fall. So we have to hit each level, each stage, until we are ready at the top, and then where do we go from there? Elementary school. <laughs> we go to kindergarten, we're ready, we're at the top of the stairs, so we're gonna walk out that door, and we're gonna go. And it's another new, whole new staircase that we're on. So we're continually learning. But you can't go from the bottom straight to the top. And I like to explain it this way to parents as well, because what I'm finding is that parents are like, Alex is so smart, he's so advanced, he's so, you know, he's so ready to move on. And he may be in certain areas, but if, unless, you're ha unless you have every component of that stair that you're on, you're gonna trip and fall. So you may be ready in certain aspects, but we have to look at that whole stair. Is that whole stair successful <coughs> for us to be able to move up to the next one? Do we really even use theories to guide our work? What do we think? Well, yeah, I would hope so. Some. Some. I think it depends on what it is and how we're pertaining it. You know, you can't be using this theory when we're talking about, I don't know. You know, it, it, depends, on, it depends on what it is. It depends on where we're at. Where are we looking at education? What are we looking at developmentally? You know, it has to be specific to what we're doing. Okay, theories guide our work in many ways. Theories give us credibility in the field with parents and other professionals. So if we go to a parent and we say to a parent, I just think this is the best way to do it. This is the way I did it with my kids, and this is the way we're going to do it with your child. What do they think of that? They feel bombarded. Sometimes they feel uncomfortable with it. But if we say, research shows, or I like to go to parents and say, I've been doing a lot of reading lately, and I'm finding that this practice really benefits your child. Are you interested in learning more about it? Let me send you some information. Let me email you about this. Why don't we work on this together? Or, hey, why don't you do some reading and I'll do some reading and we'll see where we meet up in the middle with it. Um, I think that parents seem to be more apt to research-based practice. Theories help us understand how children grow. Um, understanding the how and the why makes it a lot easier for us to get our point across to our staff. So if we're talking to our staff and we say to them, well, I know that this is happening because this is what happens in this age group. This is what happens developmentally here. Here is an appropriate expectation because the research shows us that what you're expecting is a little bit later on. That's a good goal, but where are we at right now? What can we do to help the children, ch child succeed at this point in the game, not when they're five and six years old? Theories may help us to have appropriate expectations, like we said, because we're looking at our expectations and saying to ourselves first before we look at the children, do we understand what is appropriate? Do we understand what to expect of these children and imparting that, and that knowledge to our staff? Theories help us to understand developmentally appropriate practice and its importance when working with and teaching children. Research to support the theory of cognitive development. There are numerous studies that correspond and collate and go along with and will also um, work with the theory of cognitive development. The apprenticeship in thinking, cognitive development and social context. That is um, a study that was done. The rise and fall of in inhibitory mechanism toward the unified theory of cognitive development in aging. This was actually super duper interesting and I actually ended up reading quite a bit of it and they were talking about cognitive development theory and the application of what happens to your brain as you get older and you know looking at from child um, young child age up through the elderly and the correspondence is very interesting children's sensitivity <coughs> to constraints on word meaning taxonomic versus there's their versus thematic relations so there's tons and tons of different um, research that actually utilizes the cognitive development theory and 
works with it or tries to debunk it. An example of the theory of cognitive development in action, children and conservation tax. Does everyone know what a conservation tax is? Okay, so we are going to be, we're going to watch a video and we are going to be learning about money. How many, what is left, how, okay, let me think of how to put it. Okay, so we're, they're gonna be working with the money and they're gonna be looking at taking away, putting back, and how children understand the conservation of the money as well as what happens when it's gone. Okay. What do we think will happen and what is our hypothesis? What do you think is gonna happen? When they think it's gone, they think it'll be gone forever. Right? Okay, how gone old forever. Are the children? What's how old are the yeah. children? How old are the children? I think that's important to know. Or I believe it's four to seven. Four to seven. I think that they'll think it, they'll get it back eventually. Okay. <coughs> I'm gonna make two <coughs> Now that's fair. Now that's 
Yes, there. Why is that? question we asked was wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that's okay. Okay, so what we're talking about though is that when we're looking at the conservation test, which I was totally wrong about too, is we were looking at what children perceive and what they see as opposed to what is really happening and what mm -hmm. the way the way that it's really going to look at. So when Piaget is looking at it and he is saying the different stages that the children are in. When you were looking at, okay, a pre-operational stage to understand abstract, abstract symbols and language as they go on, from he would he would we would say probably about four years old, right? So he's about four years old. As time would go on, he would understand more concretely, which is going on to the next stage, that. They were actually the same. It was just the 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 makeup was the way that it looked was different. So if we're looking at the way something looks as a way as as opposed to the way that something really is, is it the same or is it different? Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Examples of the theory of cognitive development guiding work at Little Acres Learning Guide. By understanding the major concepts of the theory of cognitive development, I know that young children are still assimilating to the world. By giving children time to explore their environment and resources in the classroom, I give them time to become familiar, and then they are ready to learn beyond what they have just explored. So giving children the time to do hands-on activities in the classroom, even if we are doing somewhat of a teacher-directed activity, giving them time to explore. Because when we think about it, they are so new to the world. It's like going into a new country for them. So we may think, oh, you're two years old, you're three years old, you should know how to clean up. Well, it's like being in a new country for children. So we're looking at it from the aspect of teaching them, modeling the appropriate behavior, and understanding that to go from one stage to the next, it takes time, it takes experience. I refer to the stages of development according to Piaget and relate them to a staircase to give my staff a visual aid when discussing child development and the importance of developmentally appropriate practice. Referring back and using the research helps me to have more credibility with my staff. I utilize the concept of accommodation when explaining the gain of new knowledge and the correlation to the way that we teach the children in our class. Interesting items about the theory of cognitive development. The learner is seen as a little scientist. Okay, so a little scientist, what does that actually mean to us? We are thinking of questions. Children are constantly asking questions throughout the day and they're experimenting. So if at home we're allowed to stand on the couch or stand on the chairs and we go to school, we're going to experiment and we're gonna stand on the chairs and we're gonna see what happens. It's like an experiment to us. As caregivers and teachers and sometimes as directors in the room and we're walking in, the first thing that we see is what? Children playing. Well, if we see this child standing on the chair. Oh, standing on the chair? Put your feet, where should your feet be? <laughs> we, we tend to not stop and think, why are they doing it? Why do these things happen? Well, they're exploring, they're exploring their world. So maybe it's that, we need to have clear rules in the classroom. Maybe they have different rules at home. Some things are okay at home that are not okay at school. At school, we expect children to be wearing shoes. Well, do we ever explain to children why we expect them to wear shoes, or do we just say, don't put your shoes on, you need your shoes on? Well, at home, mom says the rule is to not wear, sho not wear shoes in the house because we don't want to get the floors and carpets dirty, but at school, they're expected to have shoes on all the time. So sometimes there's a mixed message for children. So if we're looking at the mixed message for children, what are the expectations and why? So as a little scientist, they're always wondering, well, why? I don't understand this. You know, at home we don't wear shoes. That's the rule there. Why isn't this the rule here? But we don't take the time. So we should be taking the time to answer the questions that maybe they're not even verbalizing, but, but they have in their little heads. Piaget was seen as one of the most influential researchers in the 20th century. Piaget believed that what distinguishes human beings from other animals is our ability to do abstract symbolic reasoning. A substantial amount of preschool and elementary programs have been designed around the use of the theory of cognitive development. Piaget's research methods were based primarily on case studies. 
He did a lot with case studies. He did a lot of trial and error. He did a lot with the conservation tests and things that you saw there. And those are the rest of the steps. So now, let me go backwards. Okay. So the major concepts of the theory we have the different stages, the sensory motor, the pre-operational, the concrete operational, and the formal operational. So we're gonna take a look over here and we're going to guess which, which stage each activity is. So if we are reading Pete the Cat and his four groovy buttons, which stage do you think that this would be? Pre-operational. Good job, Grace. Pre-operational, two to seven years old, children begin to think symbolically and imaginatively. So if we're thinking symbolically, we're thinking about the buttons popping off. We're also looking at, is this somewhat of a conservation task? With the numbers of what is left, how many, somewhat. Okay, so that would be the two to seven year old stage. Then if we're looking at blocks. This could also be used as a conservation task. It could be used as building. What stage and what could we do with it? I would say maybe sensory motor and pre-operational would maybe fall into both. Exactly, exactly. Because we could do what? If we're sensory motor, we could be... Putting them together, like... And feeling... feeling um, throwing them, touching them, licking them, biting them. Good. And the pre-operational, two to seven years old, we could be using it that way when we are doing what? You're making an airplane. Yeah. Making an airplane, building different things. Uh, it can also be used in a social emotional skill with, you could be putting out the blocks and teaching the children how to share, how to work together. Good. What about a store? If we were to put together a store and the children were working together and they were they had their little cash register set up and they had all of their little food. <coughs> Where would we be? Like pre-operational and maybe into concrete operational a little bit. Okay, what about if we were using it, which is totally right, but what if we went a little bit further and we had older children and we were in a math skills class and we were working with them and we said, your mom gives you $10 to go to the store and what can you actually buy with it? And you have to remember there's tax involved and you know, what are you, how much can you spend and how much money are you going to have left? Be formal. Formal, good. So there's a lot of different things that we can do with kids that even with items that we would have right in our classroom or that we would have at home, like everything that I just kind of grabbed and pulled together today to bring in that you could be doing these types of skills with and learning what skill level they're at. And you may even have children in your, you know, your preschool class that could understand a little bit more beyond. So for them, if you're looking at an individual <coughs> focus for a child like that, you may be doing more of that giving the money out, the pretend money, and spending the money with them. And with other children, you may just be you may be having them put three items in the cart. So you can give it an individual focus to cognitively go where the child is themselves. So if we were doing a birthday party, where would we be? Well, like pre-operation, if it was like a pretend birthday party, like they just had that in the classroom, it could be like an imagined pre-operational. Okay. Uh, what about the sensory motor for the birth to two years old? What do kids love to do? What do the little little ones love to do? Are you talking about birthday cakes? Yeah. Put everything in their mouth. Yeah. Put everything in their mouth, oh, which they could, and it feels different. So they could be. Oh, I lost my can. They could be feeling it. Clearly, this is not appropriate, though. It's a little bit of a choking <laughs> hazard. But um, you could be singing "Happy Birthday," and you could be taking turns. They could be feeling it. You know, sometimes even they're just banging things together. But for them, they're learning about their world and the different things in it. Because what is the chance that a child from birth to two years old or up to seven years old is going to go to a birthday party? 
pretty good. So it's something that they can relate to the world that they're in right now. Cars, where would we be? Well, depending on the way that they're played with, they could be really in a variety of different um, stages. So it depends on the type of play that we're observing. So, I think even the older children sometimes like to play with them. They could actually be working on building a city. You could take a picture of one of the cities and say, show me how you would put together your own city. How could we fit all of the cars into the city or into a garage? Um, you could be doing it as a math skill with the children and be looking at fractions. You can do a lot of different things that would be hands-on that would relate back to the cognitive development theory and also uh, that would be interesting to them and keep their attention, especially with the older kids. And then like building ramps, angles, all that stuff, even for like older kids. Which is sometimes hard to teach. Mm -hmm. So if you're using that, or like they say like even the Lego blocks to be doing the fraction yeah. with these. So this might be something that would even still be appropriate for the 12 years to adulthood, because I know myself I can't do math, so being able to pertain it and use it works really well. Okay, so where would this go? The back of the pre-operational. Okay, pre-operational. So if we're looking at that, we're thinking, we're thinking symbolically. Parents work hard, so where do we live? Go to school. Which is something that's important to them. So as a teacher, we could use this and we could look at the cognitive development theory and we could also scaffold off of this. Who lives in your house? How many people? Do you have pets in your house? You can use, a, you can use the theory as a basis to build and build and build on everything that you're doing throughout the day. And your environment is going to be rich with different experiences that all it took was it one black crayon. You don't need to, like, like um, Fran said, you know, you don't need all of those different things in your classroom, but you, what you do need are the ideas and the research-based practice. The game of war. What do you think? Concrete operational. Good. Or informal. Um, we used it with my four-year-old over the weekend. This is as a pre-operational of learning just to take turns and somewhat of a number recognition. But it all depends on the age group of the child and where we're putting things. But you know, the concrete operational for normally, I think even the box said seven years old on it. And then the little book. Well, I guess like a sensory motor there. Sensory motor, but also we see pictures so it could be pre-operational. Good. All right. All right. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about what PIJ saw as the hallmarks, okay, of each one of the stages. So what would you say PIJ believed to be the hallmarks of the sensory motor? What was one of the hallmarks of the stages? Going back to we're looking at sensory motor. So what are the kinds of things happening birth to two years? What was PIJ thinking about what was happening birth to two years? If the human um, species, so to speak, okay, is looking for equilibrium, how is that child birth to two years? You know, where is that? Where is the child, um, where is the child? How does the child achieve that equilibrium? So just like learning about the world and the people around them. Mm -hmm. And how does the caregivers. Right, how does the child learn about the world? How is the child, their according senses. to PIJ, oh. yes, according to PIJ, through their senses, and, and what other very important senses? Their newfound Correct. motor ability. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, it's, it's really the integration of both of the senses and the motor because the child now can um, transport himself or herself from one, uh, from one place to another because of crawling, creeping, um, um, the 
beginning to walk, those kinds of things. So the child can explore a variety of different hard surfaces, soft surfaces. So when you were presenting the variety of, of um, materials, okay, um, in the sensory motor period, what the child is doing is really taking a look at the environment. What making sense of the world around him. Making sense, making sense of the world through his or her ability to explore that world. So uh, the reason that Piaget took a look at little scientists, that was his uh, terminology, was because a scientist is a, an explorer, a navigator, you know, um, trying to find out what is in this environment. And so the child doesn't have necessarily words to describe a carpet as being soft or plush Okay, or having unevenness, mm -hmm. um, depending on the pile, you know, how the pile is arranged. So we look at the child as exploring the world because the child <coughs> can, first of all. The infant cannot. The infant is in the sensory motor period. How does the infant explore the world? Through the caregiver. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, the reason the um, child might take a little bite out of your shoulder is not because <laughs> the child intentionally indicates I'm going to bite this person because I'm hungry. No, it's soft. The aroma or flavor might, you know, might be enticing because once again, this is a sensory motor being. Okay, so the fact that I'm going to nestle and cuddle and maybe sample. Okay. <laughs> this is good. This is very, very good. And this is how the child learns. And then when the adult indicates, oh, that's not what we do. Okay, that's not, you can't bite me, but you can bite this, meaning maybe a pacifier or something else that we mm -hmm. might give the child for that. And that goes back to Freud, you know, Freud mm -hmm. would say. Uh, we must satisfy the oral need, okay? Yeah, that so and that's the first stage. And so really when we're looking at a lot of the cognitive, uh, when we look at the cognitive theory, uh, some of what Piaget is saying, he's borrowing from people like Freud uh, as, as well. Um, and then of course Erickson, trust mm -hmm. versus mistrust. Okay, we're, we're looking at that. So the ways in which the child learns about the world is really not because the child can symbolically, or, you know, represent something to, that is um, essentially something else, but because the child has these new motor abilities and can get from one place to another, and is develop and, and really is testing it because of of the delimitations in other areas, must make sense of the world through the senses and um, the motor. What, are, what would Piaget would say would be the hallmarks of the pre-operational period? The hallmarks. Kind of the big three of the pre-operational. Can you remember? And, and we talked about one. All right. Okay, Piaget looked at the, at the child between the ages of two and seven. Looked at that, um, at that child as someone who, um, you know, had magical thinking, right? Magical yeah, thinking, magical remember knowledge. the magical yeah. thinking? Okay, and uh, so the child- So the imagination and being able to take the, take the environment around him, make sense of it, and then imagine and put himself into the place? Well, well or um, the, the magical thinking meaning that um, we cannot tell the difference between what is real and what is imaginary okay. because because we're not operating in um, in an arena where those um, where the differentiation is possible. So when you say the bear talks, the teddy bear talks, what does the child think? The teddy bear is actually talking. Yeah, the teddy bear is talking. That inanimate objects have life-like qualities. That's the magical thinking, okay? Inanimate objects have life, um, you know, have, have, have life-like abilities. In other words, perspective taking. Remember that as a hallmark perspective. Mm -hmm. So really, we look, actually the pre-operational period, according to Piaget, was a, a deficit period, yes. wasn't it? Yes. Because what did he say? Children in ages two to seven do not have 
perspective taking? And what was the famous <coughs> experiment? What was the famous experiment you <coughs> in the United States with you other people? What was the um, what was the famous experiment that he did that indicated that pre operational children do not have perspective taking? Do you remember that? Conservation lab? Yeah. No, that's but that's another hallmark. No. But we'll get to conservation okay. in a yeah. minute. But let's uh, do you remember the doll experiment? Oh gosh, it's a, and you know really it, it, you probably could show the doll experiment. Why don't you do that for a minute? Go back to where you were in your in your little conservation video and we can see the doll experiment. This is one of my favorites. It's not that scene, I'm sure. Okay, well you have. These are things you know, but you know what happens when you don't use them every day. And, and, and the reason I want to bring them up is because it informs us. It informs us about the kinds of things we need to consider in our classroom situation. Oh, you know what you can do? Go right back to your video. Was it on there? Wait. Uh, I, don't, I think I saw. Yeah. There you go, the doll test. Which doll is the black doll? And which one is the white doll? Not, it's not a, uh, no, go back to uh, your video, Correct. your PowerPoint. Okay. Let me see if I saw it. going on and the dolls were here and something was being demonstrated okay. and the child was here and Piaget asked what do the dolls do and the child was there at the child's side so it's a lack of perspective a lack of ability you know, to see something from someone else's perspective. So these were de deficits, Piaget said, pre-operational uh, children had this magical thinking. They couldn't distinguish you know, what was real and what was, um, what was not. They couldn't, they didn't have perspective taking. And then what was the other? The inability to conserve, okay? And the, and the reason that children, um, he felt, could not conserve was because of the way in which they were thinking. Um, so they focused on one aspect of the substance as opposed to taking a look at all aspects of the substance. So for example, looking at uh, height in the glass as opposed to focusing on the fact that it was still the same amount of water. Mm -hmm. So Piaget saw the child going from <coughs> This very deficit thing, you know, these things that children couldn't do between the ages of two and seven, into the concrete operational stage, and the, guess what? The hallmark of the concrete operational stage is really the ability to conserve. And so the ability to conserve allowed children then to engage in those kinds of operations. Okay? So um, it's, it's, it's interesting because. Some of you said, well, that would be formal, whatever, but formal operations. What did Piaget think about formal operations? What did he think about? Yeah, what did he think about formal operations? And I'm probably phrasing the question um, wrong, but anyway, do you think a lot of people reach the stage no. of formal operations? Do you know? To 
be able to do the abstractions that he characterized as being part of formally operating. Mm -hmm. And actually, some of the um, evidence that we have today is that without practice, at, without focusing mm -hmm. a lot on, um, on uh, these um, very detailed ways of problem solving, if you don't have any practice, if you don't have any experience, then you're not doing um, you know, very well in those areas. So um, we, don't, uh, we don't see a lot of, of uh, people supposedly in this stage of formal operation, if indeed that is a stage, if indeed what Piaget was talking about is really as, um, you know, um, as compartmentalized, okay, as we, as we talked about. Um, so, and obviously, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of other theory, theorists, as we know, who have built on the work of, of Piaget. Mm -hmm. Now, Piaget did not think that you could teach conservation. Okay, he did not think you could teach conservation. He thought it was something that children had to um, arrive at as they grew and learned. Um, however, subsequent theorists have indicated that conservation tasks could be taught, you know, <laughs> if you give them over and over, if you provide the children with lots of opportunities uh, to do so. So when you were uh, looking at any of these objects, you could probably make a case for the ways in which one could use them. So I'll, I'll give you an example. If you had um, young children in your <coughs> home, and any of these things, okay, were on the floor, and you had a child between <coughs> two and seven, they may be, you know, mouthy mm -hmm. yep. and feeling you know, hard as opposed to um, soft. Okay, so any of these objects could be used, could be used um, by a child in the, um, in, in the sensor motor period, in the pre-operational period. The ways in which they would be used would probably be different depending on the age of the child. So um, those are the kinds of things that we think about in terms of theories. So how do those theories then inform us? How do those theories, if we know that children um, believe in, um, in you know, um, the this that come to life, that is, they're taught. And one of the reasons that children love cartoons so much, you know, they see these animations of cows and ducks and pigs, you know, talking and laughing and uh, creating um, messes sometimes. Okay, so we know the kinds of things that really get children excited. Mm -hmm. So that's important then, that we have these kinds of things, Steve, as you brought forward today, that we have them in our environment. Um, however, let's say that we have a child maybe two days over the two-year-old period. So 24 months, two days, okay? <laughs> and he, um, you know, he's engaged in something and all of a sudden he just happens to come up to you and he takes just a little nibble. <laughs> Too, that you put all of the black or the, all of the boxes in housekeeping and they're so excited